just like on the way up, right? If I have 30% of the yield curves inverted, that's not recessionary, right? I just have three out of 10 inverted. That's just, that, that could be a waffle in the economy, right? So I need to get above 50% of those yield curves before the alarm bell starts going off. I need 50% of those yield curves to uninvert before the alarm bell starts going off. When you have that contraction of those yield curves back below 50, and really when the recession has started is when all the yield curves uninvert. But, but when you get below 50% of the, of the yield curves uninverting, that's your kind of wake up call that's probably a recession is much closer than you think. All right. Welcome to Thoughtful Money. I'm Thoughtful Money founder and your host, Adam Taggart, welcoming you back here at the end of yet another week for a weekly market recap featuring my good and brumal friend, Lance Roberts. Lance, <laughs> you're laughing here. I'm going to tell you uh, that brumal means wintry or of or pertaining to winter. You're there in Houston, Texas, normally known for being pretty hot and humid, but you guys are getting hit with a pretty hard cold snap, right? Yep, yep. That's going to be in the, you know, you know, when you, it's always interesting because I talk to my wife about this all the time. It's like, you know, we could live up north where it's cooler and you have four seasons, but then you have to deal with the winters. And so the trade off is if you want to live in Houston or Texas, right, other than lower taxes and more freedom, those type of things, um, you know, you, <laughs> you have to deal with the summers, which are brutal, right? But, you know, outside of that, you have warm winters and I have to shovel snow, those type of things until you get a year like this year where, El Nino is causing a whole lot of really cold air to get trapped into the climate. So we're going to have sub 20 temperatures come Tuesday, Wednesday of this coming week, um, which Texans are not used to. We are not used to <laughs> sub 20 temperatures by any stretch of the imagination. So we are thin skinned for sure. So you're feeling like Mother Nature is welching on the contract here. You're like, wait a minute, I'm, I, I put up with those terrible summers because I'm supposed to have the mild winter. What's going on? Correct. Uh, yeah, no, we had a brutal summer and now we have a brutal winter. So there you go. Climate change. Everything changes. <laughs> All right. Well, look, um, lots to talk about this week. Um, real quick, let me just let you remind folks about your upcoming event because it's not that far away now. It's not. Uh, January 27th, um, we're going to have myself, Adam Taggart, um, Mike Leibowitz to talk about bonds, um, and a special guest, Greg Valier, who is a presidential election political analyst. He, he understands and has been around for years, but he basically looks at the political environment, how that impacts markets, how to invest. It's going to be really fascinating. He's an awesome speaker. So I've, I've heard him speak before in the past. Um, very, very smart gentleman, excellent presentation. But if you're interested in what the upcoming election cycle holds for markets and money, um, you'll want to be at this event. Tickets are online now. If you go to realinvestmentadvice.com, there's a banner at the top of the page with Greg's picture. If you click on that banner, uh, you can buy your tickets through Eventbrite right now. The it is a, Now, here's the important thing. It is a live event and because of copyright issues with our speaker, we cannot stream it live and we cannot record it for later production. So if you wanna to come to the event, you actually have to come to the event. It's at Hotel Sinesta in Houston, Texas. Um, like I said, Adam will be there, myself, we'll talk about markets, we'll talk about macro environments, we're gonna talk about bonds, investing in the new year, and what the presidential election cycle means. It's January the 27th, so it's coming up the end of the month. Uh, from 8 a.m. to noon, we're going to feed you. So even if you fly in, we'd love to have you. We're going to take care of you, um, and uh, we'll have a we'll have a little mixer after for kind of mix and mingle talk with all the speakers. So it'll be fun. All right, it, I'm really looking forward to it. I mean, I'm looking forward to spending time with you and Michael and 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 all the people that are flying out to the event. But I'm I'm really looking forward for the keynote. Um, as you know, you know, I, I very much try to chart a an apolitical course here on this channel, but it doesn't mean that what happens in politics isn't impactful for us investors trying no. to figure out what's going on. And we are now, every day, it seems like the heat on the stove is getting turned up around the presidential election. I kind of shudder to see what it's going to be. It's going to be like a Houston summer by the time we get into near oh, yeah. And that's the great thing about Greg. He's very apolitical. He doesn't, he doesn't talk about, you know, you know, I'm, you know, I'm pro Democrat or I'm pro Republican, whatever. He doesn't talk about that. He says, look, Here's what the Democrats are bringing to the table. Here's what the Republicans are bringing to the table. This is what this means. And this is what to expect. And one of the things he's going to talk about is the thing that I've been talking about now with you for the past uh, you know, six months, 
uh, even longer than that. You know, why have we had a recession? It's because of all this government spending that's been shoved into the economy and is still going on. And that's why we continue to pump out, you know, decent employment numbers, decent economic growth numbers. There's just so much money getting spent by government. Uh, we're now at a two trillion dollar deficit. So, you know, that's the you may not like the deficit, but it supports economic growth. It's not a great thing, but it's there. Yeah. And maybe we'll get into this later on. But the conversations I've had recently with folks that, um, you know, track that spending and, and, and even some folks that, that work in industries that benefit from it, they're all saying that flood of money is like just starting. Right. Yeah. Like in terms of the approved funds, the biggest challenge they've had so far has just been finding enough shovel ready products, projects to give the money to. So there's all this sort of, you know, pent up money that's out there trying to find its way into these projects. So anyways, right. more to come as the year goes on, obviously. OK, well, look, um, let's let, let's start with the markets. Um, Lance, you might want to think about bringing up your your regular S&P chart here soon because we had a pretty strong week in the markets. Right. So markets are now back to kind of dancing. S&P is now close to dancing to its its all time high. Um, uh, you know, look, the market is what I think it's predicting a, 160 basis points of rate cuts right now for, <laughs> <laughs> for, for 2024. Uh, a, is that what's driving, you know, this this recent resurgence here? And B, once we do the technicals, like opine on like, there's 160 basis points of rate cuts in 2024. Is it just like crazy thinking? Um, like, is there is there a scenario in which the Fed is literally cutting that much and the economy isn't in crisis? Like, when I think of the Fed cutting that much in one year, I think of it like responding to crisis, which shouldn't be market friendly. But but who knows? Well, no, that that's right. I, mean, I thought it was interesting. Uh, J.P. Morgan. Uh, announced their earnings on Friday morning, and th their their earnings were actually not great. The, they they missed earnings. Uh, revenue fell by fifteen percent for the for the quarter, um, but the stock took off running at the open because they said, "Oh, but twenty twenty four is going to be great because the Fed's going to cut rates six times, and that's going to be awesome." Six times, us. yeah. <laughs> uh, it's going to you know be awesome for us. It's you know net interest income is going to be great, and and that and you know it's always interesting. You know, people make these claims that you know we I have this argument with people all the time, right? So about quantitative easing and and where the money goes and. You know, there's a lot of uh, of arguments. I was like, well, quantitative easing has nothing to do with the financial markets. That's just, you know, the bank swapping assets with the Fed and it has nothing to do with the financial markets. But yet there's this very high correlation between stock market increases and what goes on on the Fed's balance sheet. And the reason that, you know, J.P. Morgan in particular loves rate cuts and QE is because they have a prop desk <laughs> and they can. And if you ever look at earnings, where do the mass vast majority of earnings from banks come from? When you're talking about, I'm talking about JP Morgan, we're talking about Bank of America. Look at their earnings reports. Where does the earnings come from? Does it come from retail banking? No. Where does it come from? Investment banking and trading revenues. What do you think is driving the trading revenues when the Fed's doing QE? So right. it's and, 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 not and so a big leap. To, to be to be clear for folks that maybe don't understand the term prop desk is that is when the, the bank basically trades for itself internally, right? right? Proprietary prop. And um, there have been there have been quarters, and I almost want to say years in the past, during like the 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 you know yep. the the salad days of QE, where firms like JP Morgan reported perfect trading quarters. And I think close to like perfect trading years, which means every single day, they, they are making net money through their proprietary trading. And it's like you just it's like going to a casino and like winning. Yeah. You know, every single time you go into the casino, even though the, the odds theoretically are against you. And so you just look at that and you say, look, something's going on here that is stacking <laughs> the deck in favor of these firms that sit really cl close to the QE trough. Right. Exactly. No. And, and it's always interesting you know, to go beyond that statement. There were quarters where the market was down. And retail investors lost money during the quarter. And yet these trading desks had perfect trading quarters and made huge profits. So, you know, they they know exactly when to be long, know exactly when to be short. It's just, it's quite, it's quite a phenomenal miracle about how good these prop desks are at trading the markets. Yeah. Well, to me, they don't have the inside information though. That, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> they don't know when QE is coming at all. Well, <laughs> to me, this is a real sign of like, look, 
um, you know, maybe we can't say with 100% certainty there's a fire going on yet, but, you know, you see the smoke and you see flickerings of flame and you can feel the heat. Like it's, it's pretty clear something's going on. Like this is a great example of, I think, how, how captured our system has become or is becoming, right? Where uh, the, 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 the just incestuous connection between Wall Street and the power players in DC and the policymakers like at the Fed and whatnot, right? I mean, it's just, it's, there, there, there's so much advantage. There's so much control going on there that, at the end of the day, you know, money and and, and those who have the power to direct it to their advantage, it just seems to be happening more and more in front of our eyes. Like again, to your point, like you know, quarters where the market's down, you know, individual investors losing money right and left, and these guys walk away with trading quarters and record bonuses. It's just like, come on, what, what other evidence do we need of a fire there besides like actually being in, engulfed in the flames ourselves? Exactly. Well, you know, not to get into the conspiracy theory, let's move on with the technicals of the market for this week. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, you know, so it's interesting. A um, couple of things here. Let me let me share my screen here real quick. Did you give me permission? Yes, you did. Thank you. So, um, you know, interesting couple of things. So, first of all, you know, we had a very nice Santa Claus rally in the last five days of December, and then the market sold off in the first two days of the year, which negated that entire Santa Claus rally. So when, when we kind of look at the markets, we talk about the trifecta. So the trifecta, what's that? That is the Santa Claus rally, the first five days of January, and the month of January. So the, the thesis goes that if you have a Santa Claus rally, then that bodes well for the coming year. If the first five days are good, that bodes well for the month. And if the month is good, that bodes well for the year. So Santa Claus rally failed. January, first five days of January turned out a negative number. Almost tried on the last day of that five day period, the market had a huge rally. We were up over one, almost one and a half percent that day and fell just 0.13% of a percent short of actually getting a positive first five days. It was a close, close, but no cigar. <laughs> fell the first five days. So now we're talking about the rest of the month. So, you know, if we take a look at what's going on in the market, none of this has really been any surprise at all. We talked about this, um, you know, at the end of last year, the market's very overbought. We're going to either have a correction or a consolidation and consolidation where the market just goes sideways and allows that overbought condition to get worked off. Well, so far, that's exactly what's been happening. Uh, we've just been trading sideways and we have been holding right above the 20 day moving average. So that's bullish. Uh, the trends for the, for the market are bullish. We just haven't made any real progress. And that's allowing that lack of progress is allowing the 50 day moving average to catch up. It's also working off that previous kind of overbought condition. We're still on a sell signal. Um, that's the, the top chart there, the, the MACD. We're still on a sell signal. Um, that's been limiting the upside gains in the markets for right now. That overbought condition is being reduced. So this is going to set us up. If the market just kind of grinds sideways for another week or so, um, we'll be probably in a decent position for the markets to, to kind of get another leg of a rally behind it. We'll see. Uh, we've got some more work to do. Now, interestingly enough, if we look at the seasonality of presidential election years, Presidential election years, on average, since 1950, tend to trade pretty sloppy in the first three months of the year. So January, February, March, market doesn't do a whole lot. And then once you actually get into the election process, right? So starting in April, this is where it's going to be really be front and center. You know, all the ad campaigns for the presidency and, you know, all the policies are going to be put out there. And we'll have everybody, you know, throwing out their best laid plans for what they're going to do as president. And markets will like that because a lot of it's going to be based around spending, uh, particularly from the Democrat side. They're going to have a lot of spending proposals uh, to help, you know, boost the economy, those type of things. Markets are going to like that. Uh, typically, they like that. And that's why generally starting in April, the market starts to perform better. Um, and once you get through the election, then the markets kind of know what they're going to deal with. Um, and because you know, I know who's been elected. So now I know who's elected. If it's the incumbent, I know what I've got. If it's the new guy, it's going to be on promises. So markets tend to do better, even even better kind of after the election. So uh, markets tend to trade better in April, May and June, July, just prior to the election. So August, kind of August, September, October tends to be some weakness, kind of getting ready for who might get elected or who might not. 
And then you get a strong kind of year end push from that. Very similar to kind of what we saw the action being in this past year, where we had a very strong rally through July, a big sell off during the summer, and then a rally into year end. Hey, let me ask you this. What's the worst year on average in a presidential election cycle? You might think it would be the first year where they don't, they're not propping up the market. You know, they're the, the new guy's in, he's got four years to kind of win everybody over. Um, but I'm just guessing there. Well, you are just guessing, but, you know, just happens to have it that, you know, since I do um, a lot of writing, we actually kind of wrote about this recently. <laughs> yeah, so, I, I, I can ask any question with confidence, knowing that you've written an article about it. So this chart right here. So this goes back to uh, 1833. Uh, so this is the market uh, annualized return for every year. Oops, sorry. Uh, let me back. I didn't mean to do that. I forgot to pause the image thing. Um, so this chart. So on the left is every single trading year going back to 1833. And it's broken down by the, the year post the election. So the first year of the presidential, uh, the midterm year, the pre-election year, which was last year in this case. And then the actual election year itself, which would, for now would be 2024. So I've got it broken down by president, by the return, by what party they belong to. And so if you take a look, and uh, uh, your question was the first year or the, uh, I forgot, what was your question, Adam? Well, my question was, what's the worst year? But I think your data is going to uh, validate my my guess. Yeah, the, the worst year is normally the first year of the election cycle. So, uh, So in other words, 2025 uh, tends to be one of the weaker periods. So you have a 6.15% rate of return on average. Uh, you have 27 up years versus 21 down years. So your win percentage is 56% versus 76% that you have in 2024, as an example, which has a 10% average rate of return. Okay. All right. Well, look, so, you know, basically, look, uh, you're saying, look, the, the year's going to be a bit choppy, but it's probably going to end higher and probably end on a high note uh, because markets like certainty. And once the election's decided, hopefully it'll be decided. Hopefully we won't have all these awful con contestations yeah. again. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, markets like that. But then as we get into the first year, and again, I'm hypothesizing here, you know, the new guy, uh, we, you, you probably get some of the... Um, the after effects of all the juicing that was done beforehand, you get to pay the piper for that. And then secondly, the new guy's not necessarily trying to do anything crazy to prop stuff up yet because he wants to save his dry powder for later on for the midterm elections and, and then the re-election. Well, and also too, you know, there's a lot of conspiracy theories out right now. And, and I, I'll, I'll say that with air quotes because, you know, people don't like certain numbers. And there's some truth though to the fact that economic data tends to be good in the presidential election year. Um, you know, one of the things going on right now with Jerome Powell is, has Jerome Powell all of a sudden pivoted because it's an election year and he wants to keep his job, right? This is, there's been a lot of questions about this lately. Um, you know, he doesn't want to piss off the Biden administration just in case Biden gets reelected. He doesn't want to lose his job by, you know, hiking rates and, and continuing to push rates higher and cause a recession in an election year. Right. So and this is, you know, there's also kind of the thesis that the, the government doesn't want to, you know, push an economy into a recession during an election year because it will influence the outcome of the election. So there's a lot of these theses that run around. But, you know, normally it's, it's interesting. You know, last year we had a very, very good year, which was normal. Right. You have a 75 percent chance of being positive in the in the pre-election year. Uh, the average rate of return in pre-election year is, is over 12 percent. It's, it's the strongest return year of any of the four presidential years. So we had a 22 percent return last year in a market where everybody thought we were going to have a recession. So, again, you know, we're, we're kind of in that push now towards the presidential election cycle. And then, you know, the question now becomes for everybody is, well, what happens after the election? Like, do, do all the gloves come off? after the election cycle? And is that when we really find out the truth of what's happening behind the economy? We'll see. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see. What, one thing I just want to note here real quick too, because um, this is still in a relatively recent memory, um, you know, people say, oh, look, you know, everything's going to be propped up during an election year uh, because, you know, the party that's in, in power wants to get reelected you know, re or get their the next person on their um, successor on their ticket into in office. Um, 
but it doesn't always happen that way, right? Things can get out of their control. Um, sure. And if you remember at the end of, of uh, Bush one presidency, that election year, that's when the global, the wheels started coming off the global financial crisis, right? And that's when like right. John McCain famously stopped his campaign and, and went back to Washington because I'm going to fix this, right? And it was a pretty disastrous year politically, right? Yep. Uh, for the Republicans. And of course, you know, Obama uh, wrote into office then. Um, not saying that that's going to happen this year, but I'm just saying it, 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 there's potential that it could happen. It's 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 not a guarantee that that you can always prop things up during an election year. Now, I will say from my view in the cheap seats, looks like they are doing everything they can to prop it up, <laughs> and they 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 probably will. Um, but um, and you can take this down, Lance, if 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 we're done talking about it. Um, but uh, I I want to get to. And there are a few questions I have for you beforehand, but I want to get to a piece that you just published um, about recession risks maybe being higher than than, than thought. Um, uh, but but to get there from here, let's go through uh, something interesting that's just happened this week, which is we have started to see a bull steepening of mm -hmm. the yield curve, um, yep. and um, I, I believe if I if I saw this correctly right before we hopped on here. It looks like we've we've had a yield curve disinversion, is what it was called, but uninversion, right? Which is that the two thirties uh, has disinverted, um, right. and I just want to remind the audience of something that you have said many many times on this program: is it's not the inverted yield curve that gets you, right? It's it's when the yield curve uninverts, is that tends to be what sets the timer to the extent that it is a a recession predictor. Uh, it's when those yields, those yield curves uninvert, then you, you have to start worrying about a recession coming up here. So I'm just curious, how material is this disinversion of the twos, thirties at this point? Um, it, it's not a lot. Um, and, and the reason is, is the two thirty is, you know, a very widespread and there's things going on in the mortgage industry right now that is, is, you know, you're, it's allowing the, the inversion to occur, but it's probably not going to last that way. But so Adam, it's a great question. You know, the problem with, you know, picking out a yield curve of some sort. And, and again, you know, uh, the, the important thing is to understand and to, your, to the point that we've made before is that it's the uninversion of the yield curve that matters. But just picking one kind of at random doesn't tell you a whole lot. And, and I'll explain to you why in just a second. But what this chart shows you is 10 different yield spreads that we track internally. And these are economically sensitive yield spreads. So think about, for instance, your you know your credit cards are very short term in nature, right? You got to pay those off at the end of the month. Uh, the interest rates tied to you know credit card default risk rates, those type of things, but it's very short term. Uh, auto loans are like seven years on average, six years, five years, somewhere around there. So that's a little bit of a different yield curve there. Um, you think about um, you know kind of business debt as a function. A lot of those, a lot of, a lot of business debt, those are seven years, 10 years, 15 year debts. Um, and then you get to mortgages, which are 30. So different phases of the economy and different things that we borrow money for within the economy are affected by different yield spreads and, and different yields themselves. You know, what is the two year treasury doing versus the 10 or the 30? Um, that has an impact on what those loan rates are. So paying attention to one particular yield curve extracts the broader view of what's going on in the economy. So as we've talked about before, um, we focus on these 10 yield curves. So we look at the five-year, three-month, the 10-year, one-year, the 10-year, two-year, the one-year, three-month spread. So you know, all these different ones to kind of get a global look at what's happening economically. Because you can have, uh, for instance, the inversion of the 10 and the 2 as an example, but all the other yield curves are fine, which says that there's maybe just a little bit of financial stress in one area of the economy, but the rest of the economy is functioning. We saw that early on. We saw the 10-2 in, invert, but a lot of other of the shorter end of the curve were not inverted. Since then, they've all gotten there, as you can see by that box on, on the far right-hand side. You know, we have all these yield curves are inverted right now to a large degree. And importantly, you'll notice if you look at the other red boxes, that those inversions always occur before the recession. When those yield curves uninvert, in other words, the economy is moving, those, those yield spreads are moving back to normality. That's when the recession is kicking in and the economy is resetting itself. So that's that's not surprising that occurs. Um, so as, as we look at, 
you know, it, it, this is kind of confusing looking at all these different yield curves, et cetera. This way, um, let's move back and, and we take this and, and let's take all this data and let's put this into one graph. And so what? here's the question. What is the percentage of all of these yield curves doing at a given time? Are most of them inverted or is just a couple of them inverted? Um, or most of them uninverted? And, and at what point does it even matter, right? If I have just a, if I have one out of 10 inverted, is that telling me anything? And this brings up an interesting point because we hear this a good bit in the financial media talking about, well, we've had an inverted yield curve and this is going to be like 1995 because, you know, we didn't have a recession. Well, interestingly enough, if we kind of come back and look here at 1995, right here, here's 1992, 1996. See, there was never a yield curve inversion. So yes, while the Fed was hiking rates in 1995, we had just come out of a 1994 bond market crash because the Fed was hiking rates. We had an event. It just didn't feed through fully into the economy because the economy was really moving a lot. We'd just come out of recession in 91, uh, you know, following George Bush and we had the recession in 91. So the economy was just recovering from that recession. So we never had the, you know, the, the bond market was telling us there's no economic risk here from the Fed at the moment. The Fed had hiked rates. They, they'd stopped hiking rates. The economy's doing OK. And then later on in 97, 98, they started hiking rates again. That's when we had long term capital management. We had Asian contagion and we had the beginnings of an inverted yield curve. Now, here's the important thing about all this data. Take a look back here at 1984 That is a good example. We had an inverted yield curve. One of the 10 yield curves was inverted. Didn't mean anything, right? 1998, we had about 40% of the yield curves inverted. Didn't mean anything. We didn't have a recession. So this is why people are talking about, it's like, hey, we don't have any sign of a recession right now. You know, the, you know, obviously the yield curves are wrong. What, if you look back at this data over its history, and, and again, my chart stops at 1980 just to get it on this, you know, chart to make it usable. But even going back to the 70s and the 60s, what you're looking for is when more than 50% of your yield curves are inverted. That's when it tells you the economic risk is there. Um, I was using this a lot on our radio show this past week because we were talking about this. And, you know, anybody that that has ever been camping, as an example, so, you know, you, you go out camping, you're going to build a fire. So, you know, you build your little rock pit and then you put your tin, your, your kindling down, you know, do your wood shavings or whatever you use for kindling. You put that down and you build your little teepee of, uh, you know, or your cabin, however you build your fire, right, of your logs. And then you light the kindling, right? And that, lead, that kindling then ignites the logs and then you have a fire. So if you think about yield curves or economic data, that's all just the kindling and the, the logs for the fire. But if I just do that part of it, right, if I just build it, it doesn't mean that I'm going to have a fire until I apply a catalyst of some sort. And that's a match or, or a flint or whatever it is. But I've got to apply a catalyst to that structure of events that are out there that are the recessionary time bomb, right? So in other words, if you take a look at the economy, yes, we have an inverted yield curve. Yes, we've got manufacturing that's negative. Yes, we have um, you know, uh, a leading economic index is negative 20 months in a row. That's all your kindling. That's the kindling, the wood. I mean, we've got the perfect fire. It's ready to be built. But what you're missing is, is a catalyst. And this has got to be some exogenous, unexpected event that the markets are unaware of. And, and the reason that that has to be the case is because that's how markets function. It's how economies function. Right now, most consumers are well aware of the risk in the markets uh, or the risk in the economy, right? They're dealing with high inflation costs right now. They're dealing, you know, the, the pressure that's mounting on them and they're finding out more and more ways to, to get access to capital, right? They're running up credit cards or they're now tapping into buy now, pay later, which is another form of capital mm -hmm. available to them. You know, so they're, they're able to try to keep things going at the moment. What will stop consumer spending is all of a sudden something happens that they are unaware of and it is shocking and it is and it is tumultuous whatever it is and then all of a sudden they stop spending the markets have priced in Israel and uh, China and and Ukraine and all Every, this stuff that's out everything there everything that, that is known is priced in it's priced in and the markets are able to deal with that 
What the markets aren't able to deal with is some unexpected exogenous event that all of a sudden causes the market to reprice all their logic. All of a sudden, it's no longer that earnings can grow 10% this year. This is going to cause earnings to decline by 20%. I'm going to need to reduce my, my, my thought about how I'm invested. So I need to sell and reprice valuations. And this is the important thing about you know, what happened in 2020. Everybody says, well, nobody could have predicted the pandemic and the shutdown. It didn't matter. That was just the catalyst. That was right. the spark that ignited the fire. We the, are the tender and the TP and everything was there. It, it just was there. That spark. Yeah. Right. We had repo crisis going on in 2019. We had terrible economic data in 2019. The NFIB was ringing alarm bells left and right about a recession. Just needed to match, and that was that. So you know, right now you take a look at the the yield curves. We have 90 percent of those yield curves are still inverted. Only on the very, very short end, it's the one month, three month that is not inverted right now. So, so again, we, we have a very high level of inversion still in the markets, well north of what you would, well north of what has always preceded some type of economic recessionary event. Now, does this mean, now here, let me just stop right here. Does this mean we absolutely positively have to have a recession? No, not unless you have a catalyst. And, I, and, and nobody, anybody that Adam's interviewing, anything that I know, anything that anybody else tells you, nobody knows what that catalyst will be because it is something that is unknown and it will be exogenous to this overall market and economic system we're in right now. De facto, it has to be something that is not currently priced in. Cool. Um, all right. So very useful. I'm going to ask my question again, slightly differently. Okay. Which is, but you're um, saying I didn't answer it. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> sort of, but um, so you have said, I'm, I want to I combine two comments you've made. One is that you have all the dry kindling and you just need the catalyst. And then the second is, is hey, you, you, you have to really start worrying about the recession once your portfolio of inverted yield curves start uninverting, right? So we've now had a curve uninvert, right? And I hear you saying, it's it's not a five alarm fire, you know, at this stage yet. It's just one yield curve out of many that are still uninverted. TBD, whether this is a precursor, right? Is this just the first curve to uninvert and the rest going to follow? Let's assume that is the case. Let's assume we start seeing a lot of these other curves start uninverting. Right. What will that mean to you, if anything? Well, no, when you, and again, just like on the way up, right? If I have 30% of the yield curves inverted, that's not recessionary. Right. I just have three out of 10 inverted. That's just like that could be a waffle in the economy. Right. So I need to get above 50 percent of those yield curves before the alarm bell starts going off. I need 50 percent of those yield curves to uninvert before the alarm bell starts going off. When you have that contraction of those yield curves back below 50 and really when the recession has started is when all the yield curves uninvert. But but when you get below 50 percent of the of the yield curves uninverting, that's your kind of wake up call it, that's probably a recession is much closer than you think. All right. So so at, at, if we start seeing more of these uninvert, the closer we get to 50% of the current ones that are inverted, yeah. uninvert, you're going to escalate your DEFCON status around, you know, <laughs> recession and what could happen. Correct. Only okay. after I sell first. <laughs> only, only after you sell first. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But that that's where I was going on this. Okay, great. Um, so uh, since we're sort of on the topic of yield curves, why don't we just do a quick check in on bonds? Um, you know, bonds have have been a little volatile lately as I've been tracking them. Um, you know, they, they pop back up for a while. Yields pop back up for a while. On the day we're talking, the 10-year yield has now come back down to about 3.93% or something like that. Um, so what's your current assessment of what's going on with bonds? Well, and, and but, impacting so your, your holdings at all? So first of all, thanks for asking this question, because I've just been getting a ton of emails lately talking about what's going on with yields and bonds, all this. So I'm but, asking it. Let's go back to December. I said bonds had gotten very overbought. I would expect yields to rise. And in fact, we sold about 3% of our bond position saying, hey, bonds got very overbought. We expect yields to rise, could rise back up to you know 4%, 4 and a quarter percent, maybe even a little bit more. Um, because they're just so overbought. And just like stocks, bonds also get overbought, oversold. And so 
you know, this is, uh, we'll share our screen again here. And we'll actually just say, this is a chart of TLT, uh, just a great proxy for the bond, for the treasury bond market. And, you know, as we can see here, we triggered a sell signal back here in December. And since then, yields have been right. So this is bonds. So it's the inverse of yields, right? Bond prices right. move inverse of yields. So as interest rates kind of bottomed and started ticking back up, we got very overbought, just like in the stock market, got very overbought. We got to work off that overbought condition. And so we're working through that process. Now, the good news is, is just like the stock market, nothing's wrong. Technically, everything is fine. This is actually a very healthy correction. I like it a lot. In fact, uh, we're starting to dig around in portfolios looking for where our next opportunity to increase our bond exposure is. But we'd like to see a little bit more of this yield curve, this uh, th those yields kind of reverse back here a bit. I'd like to get a little bit more oversold. Um, and then, but, you know, the MACDs now, this MACD sell signal is approaching zero. We're starting to get back down to a decent entry point to add to bonds. We're not there yet. Um, and, and again, it does, you know, people ask, well, what's the yield? What, you know, wh what yield should I start buying? That's terrible. Uh, that's a terrible way to manage the portfolios. We talked, I think we talked about this last we week. We talked about this last week. Yep. Yeah. You, you got to look at the, the conditions and context. Right. Look at the neighborhood, right? Are we in the, if I pull through the front gate of the neighborhood, right? This is a gated community of bond owners. So am I in the neighborhood of, I'm not trying to get to a specific address. At some point here, we're going to work off these overbought conditions back to oversold. That'll be your prime opportunity to add your bond exposure. That could be bonds being right here where they are right now, or maybe just a little bit higher. Uh, they could be a little bit lower in price. We could be closer to 95 on TLT versus the 96.65 right now. We could be closer to 100. But even if we're higher than we are today on TLT, and we've worked off that overbought condition because we've been through a consolidation process. The risk reward entry point at 100 is better than it is today at 96.65. And I know that makes no sense to people, but that's just the oh, way the markets no, work. No, no, it, it totally does. You've talked about that before. So um, th this is not going to be a prediction, but I right. just want to kind of get a gut feel. Let, let's say we just churn sideways from here. We work off the overbought condition. So we're, we're, we're at 96.65 with much better context and, right. and there's another leg up. What does your gut tell you the, the, the magnitude of that leg up would be? Would, would we, would we starting from 96, 65, would we, would we crack above a hundred? Would you expect it to run? To oh like yeah, yeah, yeah. No, are, yeah. Are you no. expecting like a big run, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, uh, no, we're, we're looking at somewhere between, you know, if we, if, right. So this is all dependent on, on where we wind up, you know, economically. Right. So if we get in a recession, you know, we're going to be looking at yields closer to probably, uh, sorry, on TLT as an example, probably back closer to 130, 140, 150 ultimately. So again, as yields go back to approaching zero in a recession, the Fed's drastically cutting rates. But you know, our first kind of line in the sand is 120 on uh, on TLT. That's a 20 percent advance in TLT just from this level, and that's just getting back to you know previous kind of moving average support. We get above that, um, you've got problems economically. Yields are going to be dropping a lot more. Uh, so your upside is, is still, you know, we talked about this before, is that when yields were down here at, or, or bonds were down here trading at 80, we said the upside was going to be anywhere from 40 to 60%. We're still in that game. All right. Wow. Sorry. So you got a lot of TLT owners watching this video who are now really rooting for a recession. Yeah. <laughs> but again, if we don't get a re but if we don't get a recession, okay, so yields are going to reflect economic growth and inflation. So if economic growth stalls around here, around two and a half, three percent, inflation kicks around at three percent, then yields will fall to about three percent. So there's not as much upside. You get into a recession, yields are going to go towards one as the Fed does QE and starts cutting rates. So if the Fed's doing, you know, the Fed's already talking about doing three rate cuts this year. If Wall Street's right, they're going to do six. Um, the Fed is supposed, according to Goldman Sachs, they're supposed to start reducing quantitative tightening in May, back to quantitative easing by October, that's a whole additional tailwind to bonds at that point when they start buying bonds and putting them back in their balance sheet. And if they're doing that, I suspect that we've got a lot bigger trouble somewhere in the economy. So, you know, stocks will will probably have lower rates of return this year, but bonds could well outperform everything.
Okay. Well, as David Rosenberg predicted when he was on this channel, theme of 2024 will be bonds have more fun. Um, yeah. All right. But now that you get everybody rooting for recession here, <laughs> um, <clears throat> let's let's now head over to a recent article you did write about recession risks maybe being higher than uh, most folks are realizing. And I think you were kind of peering through the lens of the jobs market, right? Yeah, exactly. Full-time jobs suggest re recession risks higher than thought. So give us the main thesis of this article. Yeah. So, it, it, you know, it's interesting. I, you know, I just, you know, have, you know, I'm kind of in the same boat as everybody else trying to figure out what's going to happen next. And, and we're trying to figure that out. And, you know, if we take a look at quarterly GDP at an annual rate, you know, it's doing fine. There's, you know, it's, it's back to kind of normal, the normal kind of range that we've been in um, really since 2009, just trading this between two and a half and 3% growth. So, you know, no real sign of a recession. Um, but then where, you know, we start to actually, you know, look at things was saying, okay, look, there's a lot, you know, we, we talked about all these different indicators. The manufacturing index is negative. Um, and, you know, that's a sign that the economy is very weak. And we've talked about the, you know, the impact of the yield curves and, and leading economic indicators all suggesting that we're going to have a recession. Um, so, you know, I went and looked at the ICM manufacturing index and, and the services indexes. And, and, you know, back in the eight in the 60s and 70s, where we had, um, you know, surging inflation and, and all that type of stuff going on, manufacturing made up about 80% of the economy. Today, it's about 20% of the economy. So services is where we need to be focusing our attention. And the, the reason for that is, is that economic demand is driven by production. And, you know, we talk about that the economy is, you know, 70% based on consumption. So you take a look at the GDP breakdown, right? We say, okay, GDP is, you know, PCE, personal consumption expenditures, that makes up 68% of the GDP calculation. So just call it 70 for easy math. Yep. So 70% of the economy is driven by people buying stuff. Well, that's fantastic, except they have to work first, right? You and I have got to go to work. We've got to earn a paycheck before we consume, unless the government's sending us checks in the mail. Uh, so, but we have to produce first and then we can consume. And so there's an economic cycle that goes on. I, I, I work, I get a paycheck, I go out and consume something. As I consume something that creates corporate revenues, uh, those revenues, uh, you know, then as, as consumption increases and corporate revenues increase, companies have to hire more employees. This is the key part right here. I've got to empower, uh, uh, get more employees to meet the demand that I'm getting from the economy. That change in demand creates more economic growth, which leads to more production. And we have this nice virtuous cycle, which is where we get economic growth from. So the employment side of this equation is very important. Because if I'm not working and I'm not producing, I'm probably not consuming at least as much, right? Because I don't have a paycheck. So if we take a look at this overall cycle about how companies operate and, and take a look at the, the CEOs and how they act to protect profitability, if we start to see an economic slowdown where the economy is beginning to reduce that overall rate of demand and earnings are declining, kind of like in JP Morgan's report today, right? Their, their, their revenue was down, so less activity. Once there's a loss of confidence, then as there's a loss of confidence by CEOs, they begin cutting jobs, they stop hiring as many people, that leads to reduced demand as corporate revenues decline, and then CEOs act further as revenues are declining to protect profitability. So they start laying off more workers and they stop hiring and they start making other cuts to try to protect that profitability. And again, and, and this is why we take a look at the CEO confidence survey right now, um, as it relates to, to employment, you know, there's confidence that CEOs is very, very low right now. And this yeah, is- Yeah, look how low that is. Wow. Yeah. And, and, and that jives with that recent article that just came out, maybe you mentioned it in your one here, but the one that says like 40% of, of uh, I don't know, companies are basically expecting to lay off this yeah. year. Yeah, that's right. Because it all comes so so as long as they're able to maintain some profitability, that's okay. But um, you know, this is the, the the thing that we want to get into, which is the and and one thing that I've talked about a few times is that you know when we take a look at 
what is happening. And I want to, I'm going to use a little different chart from the article. It's the same, the same exact chart, but uh, it's a, a, a little bit better um, version of this just for this conversation. God damn it. Cut that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, here it is. Okay, so three, two, one. So, I, so you know, when I, so when we talk when we talk about CEOs and confidence and things that are going on, as we said before, it's full time employment that matters, right? So, why full time employment? Full time employment is where I have higher wages than I have as a part time employee. Um, you know, benefits. we also and, and most importantly, benefits, healthcare benefits, you know, time off, all that type of stuff. So, full time employment. Is very important. So one of the, the the things that I track very closely is full time employment relative to the working age population. And last month, we had a very sharp drop in that uh, working age population uh, full time employment to working age population ratio. And you know, yes, part of this is due to the the mass immigration we've got going on right now. But that's all been factored in. We've 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 had this mass immigration for a while. That's not new. But just in the last month, the full time employment relative to that population took a huge dive. And, and importantly, we've never even gotten back above. And this has been my point about job growth and job creation ever since the pandemic. You have beaten this drum for years. Right. All we've done is just hire everybody back. And we didn't even get back to a higher ratio than we were pre-pandemic. Right. So yes, we put all these people back to work, but there's 10 million people that are sitting out there in the working age population that we just don't count. Right. They're just they're out there and they're just hanging around and they're not in this role anywhere. So, you know, we talk about part time employment, people working two and three time uh, two and three part time jobs. They're just simply out of the labor force calculation entirely because they haven't worked in such a long period of time and not in, at least in a full time role. Um, but the important thing about this indication is that if you look back, the only times historically where you have very not you can have, you know, kind of, you know, gentle, you know, kind of declines. And that's one thing. But when you have this kind of topping process and then a very sharp decline, that has always been coincident with a recession. So this is one of those is just kind of another indicator to throw on the fire, right? It's it's our it's part of our logs and our tender that we've got sitting out there. Um, we don't have a catalyst yet, but this is just another one of those supports that says <laughs> the, the economic environment is ripe right now for a recession. Whatever causes CEOs to contract and pull back, whatever economic event that is or financial event, whatever it is. Whatever caused that to occur will allow the economy to go into a recession fairly quickly. Yeah. So, I mean, this may explain the dovish pivot, you know, that, that Powell made in December. And, and the reason for that is, is um, as you and I have talked a lot about, Lance, uh, companies have um, talent hoarded. Yep. You know, and, and that's because they you know, generals always fight the last war, right? So the last war in their mind was... All right, we shut down the global economy during COVID. I laid off a ton of people. Government restimulated everything. I had to go back and rehire those people. And man, that was hard, right? Yeah. Um, I don't want to have to go through that again if I don't have to. And so I'm going to do everything I can to hold on to the talent that I have right now for as long as I can. And hopefully, fingers crossed, we make it through this period of high interest rates and the Fed rescues me in time by bringing the cost of capital down where I don't have to lay people off, right? Right. If, if that confidence gets shaken enough, right, um, then those CEOs say, you know what, I, I thought I was going to make it, but it's looking like I'm not. I got to start jettisoning ballast from the balloon here because my profits are beginning to get squeezed. I got to start letting these people go, right? That that could be the event, right? So if it's going to be interesting if 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 Powell does not deliver <laughs> the, the six rate cuts in 2024 that the market is currently expecting, that itself could be a trigger. If the market just says, you know what, the cost of capital is not going to come down fast enough to rescue me here. I got to start chopping off, you know, limbs to save the body. Yeah. You know, and, and but one thing that, that you and I have talked about though is before is that given the fact that we, you know, we had the pandemic shutdown, 
And this is the one, this is the conundrum I'm, I'm still working with, right? So even though this full-time employment to population indicator is certainly ringing an alarm bell, you know, the thing I still struggle with is, and I even look at my own business this way, because, you know, we have, we have about 20 employees and they're all great employees. We're not going to, those, those that don't tell them this, but they have job security because they're so good at what they do. We're never going to let them go. I don't care what happens. Um, but, you know, you know, we're not hiring anybody else right now because we're kind of at capacity. So we're good. You know, the question I have is that a lot of businesses are just like mine. So in 2020, they slashed employment. Now they've hired those people back and go, okay, you know, I'm, I'm kind of at my talent pool is about where my business is. So even I can absorb a little bit of a slowdown without firing a lot of people because I didn't really overhire, right? It's not like we were having this booming economy going into the recession and, you know, we were just hiring people left and right and, you know, doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, so maybe that tempers the unemployment. So maybe we do have an increase in unemployment, but maybe it's a a four or five percent unemployment rate, not a ten, right? So, which would temper the depth of the decline during recessionary downturn, right? So, I think you know, and I don't have the answer to this question, by the way. I don't um, think you're gonna know it until it right. starts and you can measure it, right? Yeah, that's correct. But that, but this is what I'm saying is like we we've got to be a little bit careful with the major kind of economic collapse thesis because we just went through that in 2020. And, you know, we haven't had the time to rebuild all the excesses outside of market fundamentals um, <laughs> and, and valuations. But economically speaking, we didn't really build back all those excesses that we would have normally if we hadn't shut down the economy when we did. I, I, I totally agree with the caution you're mentioning here. Um, you know, I, there's lots of arguments like I make on either side of this. Um, yeah, I, of I, I, but I think the key thing that that I've been emphasizing, and I think you agree with, is like of all the indicators to be watching in 2024, like employment is going to be one of the supreme ones because yep. that really has been the bulwark, the one of the, the the principle, if not the most important bulwark against recession right now, is we've kept a well, massive amount of the the populace employed and, and to a certain extent you know finally folks have had some some wage gains right um so yeah, those are, but those are going away wage growth wage growth is actually on the decline for the bottom 80 percent of workers non-supervisory -super, uh, workers are still seeing a wage increase non-supervisory workers are seeing a wage decrease um actually i have a chart on that one second <laughs> and when you say wage decrease are, are they actually cutting wages or is this on a real basis uh, real basis on a year-over-year -year rate of change. So here, I, I've got okay. it right here. So this is wage growth of not, so this is the bottom 80% of workers. So it's non-supervisory employees, year-over-year -year rate of change. So wage growth is declining. So it's still elevated, right? It's just, and, and it's still growing. Now, this is the important thing. It's still yeah. growing. It's not growing at the rate that it was. And sure, so the, the, the impulse is declining, but wages are still going up. Correct. But they're not keeping up with the rate of inflation, which is the problem. Okay, there you go. Um, and, and and so you know when we're talking about this, um, you know, in particular, we're talking about in, in particular services. You know, services part of the economy. That's really the side of the equation that you want to pay attention to is the services side of this. So if we take a look at services as a function, um, you know, we're talking about manufacturing index has been negative. Services hasn't, and historically. You need services to go negative, especially now that services are 80% of the economy. That's the one you want to watch. We've been flirting around with that contractionary line now for the last six months, been sitting right around 50. Um, but pay attention to services. If IFSM services turns negative, 49, 48, and hangs there, um, you know, going back in history, when they're both negative, that's when you have a recession. If you have manufacturing negative, but services isn't, like we saw in 2012 during the Japan shutdown or in the Euro crisis, we had manufacturing, we were going through a manufacturing recession, but services was never negative. We never had a recession. But when they do both go negative, and that's why, you know, now pay attention more to services than manufacturing, that's your, that's another one of your telltale signs that probably we're closer to an economic recession than not. Got it. And just for folks that are listening to this on a podcast and can't see the chart here, uh, the services, so the, the manufacturing is in negative territory. The services is positive, but just barely. 
and the trend is not good. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. it looks like yeah. it's diving. It's trying to dive below that line. Not not that below is, it yet, but <laughs> that is yeah, that's great. I mean, and, and we'll get and, and you know again, it's probably it, it may get there later this year unless you know we're able to manufacture some sort of turnaround in the economy. Where could that come from? Um, more government spending, increases right. in debt. You know, uh, Jerome Powell. Uh, sorry, Jerome Powell. Uh, President Biden just announced uh, Friday that he's going to forgive student loans below twelve thousand dollars if they've been in repayment for ten years. So another boost. You know, wherever we can get a boost from, right? That's that's what we're working on. It, it, and I'm I'm right there with you, which is like there's tons of levers that the power brokers can be pulling here to try to you know avoid outcomes they don't want, like having to start firing people at scale. So right. we, we shouldn't be making any, uh, you know, super confident assumptions around what's going to happen to labor, which is one of the reasons why we have to watch it so closely. But again, you know, the the danger when with, with the layoff scenario, as your chart showed, is once you start laying off people, they spend less, and then that dampens consumer spending, and then that, that further squeezes consumer profits, forcing companies to to lay off more people. And, and that is the normal cycle of a recession. <laughs> Everybody's just obviously trying to fight it because we all don't want recessions to ever happen again in, in this, this economy anymore. Um, so one one just note here on, on recessions. So um, as you mentioned, um, there still is, is positive real wage growth for the higher end uh, of the American workforce. And you know what we have seen is is consumer spending is has held in there, uh, you know, and that's been one of the things that's been keeping the economy quote unquote you know resilient. Um, a large part of that spending is done by the top twenty percent of households, right? The more affluent households. And I was just looking at some data about some um, of the major luxury brands. Um, they're all experiencing weakness right now in terms of demand um, and the stocks are beginning to sell off. And, you know, some people are seeing that as a sign that the affluent consumer is now beginning to say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to tighten my, my belt a little bit. And that could be a removal of, of one of the important pillars that's been keeping spending strong. Yeah. I think, I think that's a little different. Um, you know, your your point is correct, right? And I but I made this analysis before. Is that, so we shut it, we shut the economy down, right? Twenty twenty, even the affluent, even 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 the affluent in twenty twenty couldn't get stuff, right? They couldn't travel, they couldn't do stuff. You know, it's interesting because you see all these articles like, well, the economy's doing great because it's it's the re, the revenge spending. Everybody's back and they're all traveling. And a lot of that, to your point, was the affluent, right? They were taking a bunch of trips they couldn't do. Um, they were buying stuff they couldn't buy. They were getting products they couldn't get a hold of during the during the pandemic shutdown. You know, I remember right in the, the middle, of, I just started in, my, in the house that I sold. I just started building a pool like in January of 2020 um, in our backyard. And then, of course, right when the pandemic hit, we couldn't get anything for the pool, right? You couldn't get the tile. You couldn't get anything to build a pool. Did, so did you just have a big hole in your backyard? Yeah, yeah. And we talked about this, you know, for like three years, like for, not three years, sorry, for like a year and a half, you know, just nothing got done. And then, you know, it was great for us because we had negotiated a really good price prior to the pandemic. And then during the pandemic, all the cost went through the roof. Well, they couldn't renegotiate the price. So I got a pool. I got a very cheap pool built. It just took a long time to do it. <laughs> but you know, to, to my point though is is is, and this is something that you've really got to understand and pay attention to when you look at a lot of data. You're gonna, you see a lot of people put out. Well, look at household debt to disposable income ratios, or look at debt to income ratios for households, or look at the savings rate for households, or and it's all great, right? It all is like very low debt to income ratios and all this, and there's very little leverage in households. That's very deceiving because you have to look at it in terms of classifications, right? Look at the top 10%. How much debt do they have versus how much income and savings do they have? What about the bottom 20% who live on basically have to have debt just to make ends meet? And we, you know, we do this analysis all the time. And so these big macro numbers are very deceiving until you dig down into what's actually going on. And, and Adam, to your point, you know, one of the things that we saw over the last couple of years is a lot of this revenge spending in those upper households. They were going out and buying Louis Vuitton bags or you know, what Hermes bag and Hermes or whatever. I don't know all the brands. My wife does that. Um, <laughs> so, but at some point, just logically, right? I've bought all I'm going to buy. 
uh, you know, I, I bought the new purses, I bought the new wallets, I bought the new G4. Right. So you, new... think, you think they just pulled demand in and, and we're now seeing the ebb of that? No, they don't pull in demand. They just don't buy as much because I don't need another Ferrari in my driveway. I've already got one, right? right. You know, I don't need six purses because I've already got five. You know, I, I'm, I'm being a little bit facetious, but you get my point is that kind of there was this, this period that we saw for a couple of years where there was a lot of spending of people kind of catching up for not being able to do stuff during 2020. But we're kind of getting past that now. I've, I've I've taken the trips, I've done the cruises, I've you know I've gone here, I've gone there, I've bought everything I want to buy, and, and now I'm just kind of the point to where I'm just saving more money and investing it, and not really spending as much. So it's not really a my point is it's not really a contraction. Like oh, I'm having to tighten up my belt because everything sucks. I'm just kind of running out of stuff to buy. <laughs> right, right. You know, so you again, you're sort of talking like a, a luxury saturation where it's like, hey, yeah. I, I got all this stuff. I don't need any for a while. I'm good for a while, right? Yeah. Um, and, and I guess it's sort of TBD. We'll we'll, we'll find out. Um, exactly. But to get to recession or slower growth, we would think we would need to see um, lower demand amongst the affluent purchasers that have been driving things. We are beginning to see some lower demand. TBD whether they're just taking, this is the pause that refreshes or whether they're actually worried about maybe like, hey, maybe I'm not as confident in my job anymore because I'm uh, I'm a manager in this company and I'm hearing the top brass talk about how they might have layoffs this year, right? <laughs> there, was a great, there was a great article in the Wall Street Journal yesterday about, you know, uh, corporations and talking about, uh, actually Thursday, um, talking about the janitorial staff and the secretaries in and like the IT people in corporations because mm -hmm. they overhear everything. Um, you know, they're they're like the, they're like the bartender or the bellhop guy that yeah. knows everything about a building. And I'm talking about like the IT guy. You know, he says, "Well, if I hear, you know, like people call me into an executive office and they just talk like I'm not there, they just assume I'm invisible. I'm fixing their computer and they're talking about, oh, we're going to lay off Joe Schmo next week because we just can't afford him or whatever the issue is." And then Joe Schmo will say, hey, can you come give me an upgrade on my computer? And he's like, yeah, I'll get on that. And then he just doesn't <laughs> do it because he's like, I'm not going to upgrade the computer if the guy's getting fired. Right. So so it's interesting that, you know, the, these you know kind of bottom tier people of these corporations, they know all the tea. Right. They, they've got the spilled tea on everything that's going on. And they're like, we're looking at the walking dead you know, of these executives <laughs> around the, the building. The, there's got to be some way to like take advantage of that and make a trading, you know, strategy off of it. Um, you know, I don't know if you ever read the Jack Reacher books, um, yep. but he, you know, he did his time in the army and he always talks about the value of the sergeants um, because that's the, was that like the highest rank that an enlisted person can get to before you're an officer, right? So they're between all the enlisted guys and the top brass. And so they kind of know everything. They're at the, the center of the flow, right? So to your point, like, we, we always hear about like the, when the shoe shine boy is recommending the stock, that's the time to get out, right? Because it's trickled down to somebody who knows nothing about the system. It's kind of the inverse of that. You know, if you can, if you can tap, you know, the sentiment of the guys that are, you know, ubiquitous in the companies who are kind of hearing all this stuff, that would be a really cool indicator. Well, it's kind of like the CEO confidence. They, they actually have two indicators. They have the CEO confidence and the CFO confidence indexes. Which is kind of a little bit, right? They survey all these CEOs and CFOs and go, "What are you thinking?" And, and the CFOs right now are going, "Yeah, we're kind of tightening up around the tightening up around the belt, so you know a bit." So, you know, it's it's kind of there. Yeah. Well, so again, we'll, we'll be tracking all this stuff. Um, talking about data earlier, um, I wanted to make sure we I, I asked you the questions, uh, these questions about the recent inflation data that came out just to see if it's affected your your worldview at all the markets. Um, real quick for folks that didn't see the data this week, um, we got new monthly CPI numbers for December. Uh, bad news was that headline CPI was higher than expected. So it jumped up from 3.1% to 3.4%. Expectations were at 3.2%. The good news is that core CPI uh, dropped below 4% for the first time since May 2021. Uh, that's basically headline CPI minus food and energy because they're more volatile. Um, that's that's I think the Fed looks a little bit more closely at core than it does CPI. So that's that's quote unquote good. 
But then again, back on the bad side is what the Fed has been saying. It's really been looking at recently is something called super core, which is core CPI, which is X food and energy. And then they take out shelter as well. Um, that rose uh, to 4.1%, which was higher than expected. So we kind of have this mishmash of cross currents here. Um, let me just read these stats that accompany this information. Um, so we can talk about, you know, blips and dips here and there with the CPI data. The reality is, is that headline costs are at record highs right now. Core costs are at record highs and food costs are at record highs and fuel costs are not, but they're on the rise again. So the point is, is even if we're still disinflating here, kind of on the, you know, the majority of these, these data points, we're still at record high price levels. So just for folks that have to live in this real economy, you know, we're still kind of paying the highest prices we've ever paid. So anyways, right. what, what is your takeaway from this most recent data? Does it change anything in your mind? Well, first of all, you, you, you know, you got to remember two things, first of all, about the data. The first thing is, is that, yes, record prices in these issues are there. The Fed doesn't want lower prices. OK, let's let's remember that the Fed wants higher prices. They want those prices to go up two percent over the next year. Right. right. They want them to go higher just at a slower rate than they've been going up. Yeah. Right. And then that's the other side of this is that you're looking at year over year rates of change in this data. So, um, you know, PPI on Friday came in weaker than expected. So headline was uh, headline and core were both much weaker than expected. So, you know, that, you know, kind of on the producer side, we're still seeing lower costs there. So hopefully that will transition at some point into lower costs for consumers. But, you know, right now, you know, the interesting thing is, is that inflation is stabilizing right around 3%. So this, what I find interesting or what does interest me or, or pique my curiosity at this point is why the Fed would talk about cutting rates with inflation at 3%, not 2 why would the Fed start talking about cutting rates and more importantly doing QE with inflation stabilizing at 3%, not 2 So, you know, this is the interesting thing that, that the Fed either A, knows something that we don't know yet, right? They've got access to a piece of data that we don't have that says there is some systemic financial risk somewhere in the system, which is why they're now talking about rate cuts and would explain why the Fed such made, made such a dramatic pivot, you know, in the last month or so in terms of their policy stance. Because remember, back in September, we've got we, we've got another rate hike on the table. Come November, yeah, we're done hiking rates. What happened? You know, what's out there now? now we know there's issues going on with the repo market right now, very similar to what we saw in 2019 when the Fed made their their ultimate pivot back in 2018. Uh, we didn't know any problem existed. And all of a sudden, this repo issue you know, surfaced in 2019. So is that what the Fed's looking at? They don't want a repeat of what happened in 2019. So now they're 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 you know cutting their stance. But the problem that they do run the risk of, and and you know, this was this was the interesting debate that Mike Leibowitz and I were having for quite some time, is that I was arguing for the Fed cutting rates. And, and, uh, and Mike Leibowitz is saying, no, they won't because they'll lose all inflation fighting credibility at that point. The market will just lose confidence in the Fed if the Fed cuts rates too early. Well, they've cut rates too early, or at least implied they will, and everything is doing okay, right? Bond yields are falling. They're not going up. Bond prices are stabilizing with the rate of inflation, which is what you'd expect them to do. So I don't know. Um, you know, I think the Fed runs a real risk of if, if we do get a resurgence of an economic activity. Um, and again, we've talked about monetary accommodation, monetary uh, conditions, right? Rising asset prices spark consumer confidence. Consumers go out and start buying stuff again. So if we see that consumer confidence pick back up, and if we see, which we are seeing, consumer confidence is improving. And if we start seeing that consumption side of the equation start to gain some steam, the Fed runs a real risk of having another surge, another, I shouldn't say a surge because it won't be like what we saw previously because we're not seeing checks to households, but they do run the risk of inflation drifting back up towards three and a half or 4%, which I don't think they're prepared for. Okay. Uh, so just on that point, um, just a quick little commercial for folks, uh, the video that's going to come out the day after this one uh, is with um, Lakshman Achuthan, um, whose you know, big focus is economic cycles. 
And um, he specifically does a deep dive in, in that that interview about inflation, showing that you know historically inflation is cyclical. He's got some some in, really interesting charts that are a little bit scary that basically you know suggest uh, in, in from his analysis <clears throat> that it is more likely that we're going to see uh, a rise in inflation here just for purely cyclical reasons. Yep. Uh, and then of course, if the Fed is easing too early, it just pours gasoline on that, right? So. Right. Um, who knows? We'll have to watch it all closely. But I, I do want to say, if you're, if you're, if, if Lance's caution there caught your attention, you should watch that interview with Lachman. Yeah. And then look, Lachman's a really smart guy. Been doing this for decades, <laughs> so you know I, I certainly don't discount. And and his and his models are are good. Um, I certainly wouldn't discount them. Okay. All right. <clears throat> um, just one more one more element that we'll be tracking on a weekly basis for your folks here on in terms of what goes on. Um, all right, uh, trying to think how many of these other topics I can squeeze in with the time we have left. Um, I just want to ask. Uh, we don't need to get into this in depth, but um, when I brought this up the other week, Lance, you were a little bit like, ah, "I'm not that worried about it," um, and talking about the closure of the Red Sea. Um, right. You know, recently, what's now happened there is we've had Iran hijack an oil tanker in the Gulf of Oman, right? Um, we've had Houthi rebels, um, Iran-funded Houthi rebels um, in the Red Sea. They've been peppering, you know, ships through there with with attack drones. Basically, shipping stopped through the Red Sea. Um, now that has escalated, though, where the U.S. and the U.K. just in the past, I think, like 24 hours hit like 60 Houthi uh, military targets with missiles um, in Yemen. So, um, you know, this is escalating now, right? Who knows what's going to happen? You know, uh, Houthi rebels aren't necessarily the Russian, you know, military. Um, but uh, things are heating up in a very, um, you know, uh, volatile, but also very strategically important part of the world here for global trade. Are you getting any more worried about this or still? No, not, not, not. no not really. And uh, on January the 5th, we bought energy stocks for specifically this reason. So, you know, it's and those are, you know, it's, they've kind of been fluctuating around here a little bit with oil prices. But, you know, oil prices have been picking up here finally, uh, starting to get a little bit of pressure, uh, kind of upward pressure because of the situation. Wait, you're, you're not price. worried because you're going to because you think your energy stocks will yeah. do well or you just don't think it's going to be that. No, it's, it's, no, no. First of all, the market's going to the market's already pricing this in. So, again, you know, the, the markets are holding up well. The markets understand what's going on. You know, markets are down a little bit on Friday, um, but, you know, nothing major. So the markets are pricing in you know, the severity of these actions. And this is not going to be something that th this will in the next month or so, it'll be over, right? Whatever it is, it, it'll it'll be done with and, and we'll move on from that. But in the short term, it's a great trading opportunity. Like I said, it's pushing oil prices up. And as a function, we're, uh, you know, the oil trades we put on are starting to work nicely. So, you know, I, I got no complaints. So, Okay, I could dig more into this with you, but but the next couple of questions we're going to have to just suffice with short answers, just because we're we're getting low on time, and I want to get your trade. Next, next week we go into more. So okay, um, so I'm also seeing more more negative headlines coming out around uh, both in the U.S. and in Europe, coming out around um, sort of a, a sense of futility about the, the ongoing war in Ukraine. Right where there's, there's increasing questions about should we continue sending the amount of support that we have? I've seen some recent headlines in Europe, like you know, actually was supporting this war a mistake? Are we actually not achieving the objectives that we thought it was going to? Um, you know, obviously populists just just begin to get tired of of, of wars um, and eventually want to try to find out how to extract themselves from them. So I, I just want to ask you to sort of do a mental exercise with me here. Yep. If, if in 2024, the Western powers that have been backing the war in Ukraine kind of start pressuring Ukraine for a, a, a peaceful settlement with Russia, which I think Russia has already indicated it's trying to open the doors to do that, uh, and and the war comes to some end, um, what impact do you think that'll have on markets? Uh, uh, very little. Um, yeah, it's kind of like, you know, when we pulled all of our troops out of, out of Afghanistan, right? There was just, 
you know, it was like done and over with and, and we'll move on. So I think the markets would like the fact. So actually it's, it's, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, right? So if we end the war with Ukraine or, or end our support for Ukraine, um, I don't think the markets will go taking off to the moon because of it. Um, one of the, but the beneficiaries of wartime spending will, right? So in other words, uh, uh, Raytheon and Lockheed Martin and General Dynamics, those right. stocks have, they haven't done great. Um, you know, I thought they would have done a whole lot better with the amount of money being spent, weapons being sent over to Ukraine. I thought they would have performed better. Um, but, you know, that that boost to earnings from wartime spending will certainly go away. So, you know, I, you know, we, we're long RTX. We've been long RTX for quite some time. Um, but if they start announcing the end of, of spending and support for Ukraine, we'll probably sell that position. Okay. Um, but you're, and again, we're, let's just assume here we're talking about a, a, an end to the war. Yeah. Um, uh, it doesn't sound like you think there's a massive, any super material piece premium that would get added to, to markets in general. Would you expect things like maybe oil to come down in price in anticipation that like, well, we'll, we'll start trying to reestablish some sort of economic trade with Russia and a lot of these boycotts will eventually go away. Yeah, it, it maybe. I think the, the the place to look, though, is, you know, BlackRock is already in to Ukraine um, in a big way. And they're, they're already uh, building an infrastructure okay. fund. So the rebuilding, okay. you think that's the opportunity? Yeah. So the opportunity would be if you can find the companies that will be. So BlackRock is they're they're lining up hundreds of billions of dollars to rebuild Ukraine. So the 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 trick will be to try to find the companies that will benefit from that infrastructure rebuilding of Ukraine. So think, and I'm just I'm, now what I'm about to say is don't take this to the bank like oh Lance said this stock's going to do it. I'm saying think about things like Caterpillar. They're going to need. Uh, tractors and bulldozers and forklifts and all that kind of stuff over there to, to you know backhoes etc to do that construction. Who's going to supply the cement? Who's going to supply the lumber and, and and the wiring and the technology and all these different things that are going to be required? Um, so you know once that war ends and they start the rebuilding effort, that's where money's going to be made. Unfortunately, if you've got access to or I shouldn't say unfortunately, but fortunately, if you've got a whole lot of money. And can work your way into BlackRock and get into the private equity piece. It's going to do that rebuilding. You'll make a lot of money with that. Okay. All right. And again, I'm sorry to give such short shrift to these really sure. interesting questions. We just really short on time. All right. Um, again, we're going to we're going to irritate a certain percentage of people with not being able to talk a lot about this. Um, so the Bitcoin ETF was approved yep. by the SEC this week, um, not without some drama. Um, with their, you know, a, a Twitter account, or their X account getting hacked and this getting prematurely uh, announced. Um, how material do you think this is? Um, and, and, you know, I, I know you, you, we've talked a little bit about Bitcoin in the past, and it's not something you hold in your client accounts, although you hold some personally. Um, is, is it a big material factor that, you know, now a lot more capital can flow into the space and it's sort of got the blessing, you know, to a certain extent, if you will, of the establishment by, by letting this go through? Is this a buy the rumor, sell the news type of thing? What, what do you think? Well, so far, well, first of all, it's only been two days. <laughs> so since this yeah. occurred, I, I did find it very interesting, though, that, um, you know, Bitcoin ETFs have been big losers over the last two days. Um they were down on the day of the announcement on Thursday. They were down on Friday. Um, for instance, like Arc, uh, Arc, you know, Kathy Wood, uh, she was one of the ones that there was there was eleven or twelve, and don't get me exactly. The, the, I haven't done enough research yet on all the ones that got launched, but there were eleven or twelve ETFs that got uh, launched, and two of them, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, and there's another one that was a previously existing ETF. They're in transition into the spot ETF. The rest of them were, are, were initial spot ETFs right off the bat. All the ones that were initial spot ETFs off the bat sold off the day of the, the day they went trading, which I thought was interesting because there was a lot of inflows of capital, a lot of excitement around this. I would have thought that that, you know, just you know, expecting that those would have performed a whole lot better than they did. So I don't really have an answer for you why they performed so poorly. Um, given that this has been a decade in the making, that, that we've been want, you know, they've been wanting to have these Bitcoin ETFs. 
um, that they didn't perform better out of the gate. Well, you know, what this means going forward, I don't know. There, you know, there is an interesting dynamic to this, though, that I'm still trying to write. And I don't, and look, and I don't have the answer to this. So I'm, this is, I'm still thinking about it and, and I haven't got everything put together. But there is a finite supply of Bitcoin, right? And I can only, and, and the more I mine for it, uh, the less supply there is. So in theory, you know, it would seem like these ETFs are going to be fantastic for the price of Bitcoin because you have a lot of money chasing a very defined amount of Bitcoin because it's, it's I can't just keep producing Bitcoin every time. Some, and if you don't understand the way an ETF works, an ETF creates new shares basically whenever you, you buy it. So, you know, the if I'm an ETF provider and I get $100 million in today, I can create $100 million worth of ETF shares and we're good. And I do what I got to do on the back end to balance all the books. So, you know, it's, you know, the, the, the fact that these have to be backed at some point by Bitcoin should be great for the price of Bitcoin. Uh, estimates right now that the price of Bitcoin will go to a hundred thousand or, or more. I've seen some really crazy ones out there, like half a million, um, which would be great because my Bitcoin that I, that I own will make me a lot of money. So I'll be all happy about that. But, you know, there is this other side of it. And I think we need to watch what's happening with these ETFs. You know, I if I if you're thinking about buying these ETFs and getting into it, I would just wait right now. Um, let these things kind of sort themselves out for a few days. Give them a couple of weeks. Get a little bit of trading history behind them. Let's see how they're actually trading in the market, how they how they react relative to the price of Bitcoin itself. So if, if Bitcoin is up 1% one day, the ETF, since it's a spot ETF, it should be up 1% that day. So are they tracking each other? You know, this has been one of the big, concern, you know, big problems with the VIX indexes for so long. People want to trade the VIX index. And so you buy the VIX ETF and it doesn't track the index because of the optionality and all these other things that occur. So give this a couple of weeks, give it a month, um, get you some technical data back there where you can see how it moves relative to the price of Bitcoin. You can start getting some overbought, oversold condition analysis in there. Um, and then if you want to add it to your portfolio, you know, go for it. I, I you know, certainly, you know, wouldn't, you know, uh, suggest you shouldn't. So. All right. Um, so let me just, uh, let me just ask you to just postulate here. Um, how, how, how material a development is this for Bitcoin, in, in particularly on two dimensions? One is just kind of sort of legitimizing it, right? Where, you know, you know, initially you had the, the slam that it's for, you know, it, it's funny money that that tech guys created or it's for money launderers or it's for criminals or whatever, you know, now it's available to be bought by institutions and, and the masses, you know, through these, these, these ETFs. And then secondly, you know, buying Bitcoin uh, has friction in it, right? For, for the average person who's not super tech savvy, you know, you first, you got to kind of learn what Bitcoin is and how it operates. And then you got to open, you know, a, a, a place, a, a, an account uh, at a place like, Coinbase or whatever, right? And then you got to fund it, and it's not, you know, there, 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 are delays in both getting your money in and certainly getting your money out, and it's not super duper easy for the not super tech savvy to to really jump into. Where with an ETF, it's just oh easy, right? It's just like buying a stock, right? So right. all of a sudden, they've removed a ton of friction for the average investor, at least uh, in this. So how material those two things? But friction both up and down. It makes it very easy to just dump ETF, you know, dump the ETF just as easy as I can buy it. So, yep. you know, it, it provides, a, you know, one thing that this could do is really, if you thought Bitcoin was volatile before, it could get really volatile now. So, yeah, it, it will. And on that thought, um, doesn't it become a lot easier to short Bitcoin now? Yeah. Yeah, this is going to provide a whole, you know, a whole new avenue of, of ways because once you get the ETFs out there, and then I can start launching at some point, I can launch options against the ETF. So now I can do call options and and put options against the ETF. I can short the ETF. I mean, it's it it gives you know the the institutions a lot more, a, you know, many more ways to, you know, you know, move the price of the index in whichever direction that they want it to go. So, you know, you can, so again, this is what I'm saying, this could lead to a lot more volatility. 
you know, for that. And again, you know, you kind of made an interesting point, you know, does it give it more credibility? And, you know, even the SEC had, had made a statement in their in their approval about it, you know, the the fraud and, and the criminal aspects yeah. of Bitcoin, et cetera, that's been going on. This doesn't change any of that. You're not, you know, you're not, you know, creating an environment that makes it, you know, makes the actual Bitcoin itself any less subject to being used for criminal activity or whatever. I mean, that doesn't change, you know, any of that. It just now gives people an, an ability to buy something that has a lot of media hype around it. And don't forget about the way Wall Street works. Wall Street doesn't care if you lose your money. Wall Street doesn't care if it's being used for criminal activity or whatever. They just see an opportunity where I can create an ETF and you're going to throw a bunch of money into it and I collect a fee. There was over $2 billion in volume yesterday in those ETFs on the first day at a quarter bit. So if I'm making, how much money did I make yesterday on one day's worth of trading volume? So don't forget this is about money. And it was just like SPACs back in, in 2020. We just came to market with all kinds of SPACs. Did that change the game for how the markets work? No. Markets just figured out a way. Well, IPOs take too damn long to get to the market. I'm losing too much opportunity here because people have $5,000 checks they want to throw into the market right now. I need to get them some product. All these SPACs came to market and now a whole swath of them have gone bankrupt. <laughs> Vaporized, and people yeah. have lost all their money. So don't forget, and look, whether you're, you're an advocate of Bitcoin or you're negative on Bitcoin, I don't care. Just understand that this is about a Wall Street product. Wall Street pushed the SEC to do this so they can make money off of you. They don't care if Bitcoin goes to zero and they don't care if Bitcoin, Bitcoin goes to a million. They don't care. What they care about is that quarter point fee they're going to collect from you every single year because they just annuitize that business. So totally agree with that. Um, and it's very much part of the caveat emptor of any new product that Wall Street introduces, but certainly one like this that has a lot of uh, potential for things to go sideways. Um, and, and I'm not I'm not trying to rain on, on Bitcoin's parade here. Parade here. Um, and, and again, back to my point of legitimacy, um, you know, again, I think a lot of people didn't invest in Bitcoin because, again, it was sort of hard and there was fears of like, well, maybe the government's going to outlaw it. You know, you know maybe the SEC is, 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 is going to crack down on this, right? The fact that the SEC is now letting it happen, even though they, they put out that total CYA information, right? <laughs> yeah. The fact that it's still happening, it does remove, I think, a lot of people's fears of like, oh, well, then I guess the government maybe isn't going to crack down on this thing. And maybe it is more legitimate. And, and they're creating on-ramps for new capital here, right? So it just it gives people this sense of legitimacy that I know the Bitcoin community has been waiting for for a long time, right? Oh, well, gosh, once institutional money starts flowing in here, man, it's going to be off to the races. That very well may be true. Um so both things can be true. You know, it can be coming more legitimate in the eyes of, of investors. And it could still be, you know, a, a way for Wall Street just to continue to rape our wallets. <laughs> so, you know, in reference to the ETF, yes, the 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 amount of, you know, it does reduce the friction for the average person to put money, you know, into an ETF. And, and that's great, right? You know, and so if you've got a few extra bucks in your account, like, ah, you know, kind of Vegas money, I'll just throw 500 bucks into this and see what happens. You know, it's going to get a lot of those people in. As far as regulation goes, it, you know, these ETFs don't but don't really stop the probably I would say the inevitability of regulation at some point. You know, it's been it's been interesting so far with Bitcoin. I mean, we've gone through FTX, uh, the whole situation with uh, FTX and and that whole kind of a blow up situation. Then we've had then of course there was a situation with Binance right after that. So, I, I, you know, at some point, if we continue to have these events that occur where the average retail investor loses money because of fraud or because of you know, bad management or whatever it is, the SEC and the government are in the Treasury Department. And particularly if there's you know, right now, Bitcoin is so small relative to the amount of currency that's out there. Um, it's not a threat to anything. But, you know, if Bitcoin ever rose to the level that it began to threaten the dominance of the dollar, 
Um, if it ever, you know, if we have more situations of fraud or massive investor losses because of some bad actor in that space, regulation is going to come and, and it will, at some point, they're going to require all Bitcoins to be registered. The identity, just like if you own a stock, they know who owns what share of stock, you know, in what account, all that's public record. It's, and the government has all that data. So at some point, the government will step in and require that regulation if it becomes a big enough issue. The, the ETF doesn't deter that pathway uh, of it happening. And, and the more event negative events that occur, the more the demand will be for regulation, just like with Enron or WorldCom and all that stuff that happened back in uh, 2000, you know, we had to come up with Sarbanes-Oxley. The crash in 1929 is what created the SEC in 1933, 1934. So whenever you have, or Madoff in 2008, the financial crisis, we came up with more rules and regulations to prevent those bad characters and those bad actors from happening. So ETFs don't resolve that issue, but it does give access to the average person now to get obviously engaged and, and, and to get involved with Bitcoin now on a much easier basis. So, you know, from that standpoint, I think it's a great thing. All right. Okay, gonna have to leave it there on that because um, we got to wrap. We got to start wrapping up here. I want to get to your trades, um, and the audience hopefully is unaware of this. But we have had so many technical interruptions in recording this thing. <laughs> this has gone way longer than uh, you know the, the length that the audience is at listening to this right now. So we, we do have to start wrapping this up here. Um, so, all right, let, let's first get to your trades. What, what if anything have you done over the past week? So uh, in the past week, we've uh, started taking on positions. Early last week, we bought positions in Eli Lilly and United Healthcare. Um, one of the reasons are is, is that, first of all, the, the uh, GLP-1 uh, issue for Eli Lilly is front center. It's the, it's the new AI stock of the healthcare sector. So, you know, that's, um, you know, one of the reasons we added Lilly. But we also added healthcare uh, or increased our healthcare exposure in our portfolio because A, we'd done some tax loss selling in the healthcare sector last year. So we needed to increase the weighting for this year. But healthcare is also one of the sectors that are expected to have some of the strongest earnings growth this year as well, besides technology stocks. So we added those two positions. We also, like I said, the week before, added uh, oil and gas drillers, as, uh, oil, uh, oil, oil producers and drillers, I should say, uh, the week before that because of what was happening um, in the Red Sea. Okay, got it. Um, boy, this could be a, a rant in and of itself. Um, and, and we'll try to avoid it because I want to squeeze a small one in before we're done here. Uh, but I was just reading an article uh, yesterday, I think it was, about how healthcare premiums have gotten so out of control now that, um, that even people who are covered by health insurance are having trouble paying their, their bills at this point in time. Um, which maybe bodes well for profits of, of healthcare companies. But I mean, it seems like we're really getting to, I don't know, we're getting closer at least to a breaking point where I think consumers are saying like, even having health insurance really isn't helping with the affordability issue for healthcare for me these days. Like, I, I wonder if we're going to start seeing people, unless your employer doesn't, unless your employer covers it for you at some affordable rate, people just saying like, why have it? There's almost no difference between having it and not having it anymore. It's just unaffordable in both cases. I have 10 words for you. This is what happens when you let government get involved. Yeah. Yeah. And I know we've railed about the same thing in the education system and a lot of other parts. So anyways, uh, I mean, it was assumed by that statement, you think the beatings are going to continue until morale's yeah. improves, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, at some point you've got to get government out of the system. Uh, when you, when you put more and more players between the patient and the doctor, the costs have to go up. More players in the middle doesn't bring costs down. It takes cost up. And, you know, we've talked about the fact there's, you know, cash only doctors out there that you can go to that are very cheap because it is directly patient to doctor care. And that takes all the middleman out of the middle. Pay cash for your health care. You can save a lot of money. 
So as I mentioned many times, I'm from a family of doctors. I, I actually know a lot of doctors as well, just as friends, people in the healthcare profession. And, and it is amazing to me to see how many of them are now moving to what's kind of called concierge medicine, where they are creating a direct relationship like that with, with their clientele. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, you know, the bottom line is, is that, you know, the biggest mistake we ever made was wanting $20 copays. Um, you know, we talked about this before with like with car insurance. If you just took care of your health, right, eat right, exercise. And if you get a cold, you go to the CVS and get you some cold medicine and take care of it. But, you know, when you start running to the doctor or to the, you know, the hospital emergency room, every time you get a sniffle, that just drives up the cost of healthcare, and and so you you know as as individuals we need if we became more responsible about our healthcare, oh. um, it, that that the decline in demand on services would bring healthcare costs down because it's a supply demand issue as with anything in price. So totally agree, and you know they they basically have done away with sort of the catastrophic care plans that you used to have where yeah. you could say look I I I will forego you know, coverage for the regular stuff. And I just want to have coverage in case I break an arm or get cancer or whatever. Yeah. Right. Um, but they've removed that option. Right. So everybody's been forced into these plans that you're talking about. Well, that's right. Because that was part of what the government wanted, um, you know, with the, with the advent of the affordable care act that, you know, we lost. And when you started combining high risk people and low risk people in the same risk pools, that just created a huge explosion in cost because all of a sudden, you know, somebody with a pre, you know, this idea of covering pre-existing conditions sounded great in theory, but if I have a pre-existing condition and I go in the risk pool, I've got to immediately cover that person. The whole point of the risk pool was I put a bunch of healthy people together and they all pay premiums and they pay small premiums. And if somebody gets sick way down the road somewhere, that's okay. I can cover that because I've had this period of, of these premiums coming in. But as soon as you start injecting people that have demands now for that, I have to raise the cost of premiums. That was the beautiful error, I should say, of uh, the Affordable Care Act. Yeah. And then that's combined, obviously, with um, just consumer behavior becoming less and less healthy over time and just taxing right. the system more and more. All right. Uh, maybe we should dive into that in a future rant. Um, okay. <laughs> so um, let's see here. Uh well, let's put it this way. This is this this is th there was a rant I I wanted to get to today, but it it's going to require a lot more time. I kicked open over a hornet's nest that is still buzzing. Um, so we're just going to have to leave that one for next week. There, there is one that I do want to because it's short. And I want to try to squeeze in here, um, which is uh, you know I I've, <laughs> I don't know if it's a sign of the times or whatnot, but I've, I've definitely had some some experiences, social media and otherwise, recently where. I would say I've, I've I've seen people handle themselves inelegantly is probably the nicest way that I can put it. And um, those have been experiences that have reminded me of some really great wisdom that I've gotten from one of my mentors. Um, and his his uh, advice served me well, even very recently, as I transitioned out of the company I worked for formerly into creating thoughtful money and going fully independent. And he, you know, he basically said, look, you, you you, you, you want to do everything you can to control the outcome to get the outcome that you want, but there are things that are out of your control, right? And he said the most important thing when you're going through a challenging period of time or a challenging interpersonal exchange is you want to ask yourself going in, who do I want to be in this experience, right? Like I, I can't control exactly what's going to happen, but I can control how I behave and what my motivations are and what values I hold and, and the person I want to be through this. And, and sort of the, the exercise is, is imagine yourself looking back on the event, you know, with the benefit of a year or two's time. Um, and are you, are you, are you proud of who you were and how you handled yourself through this, no matter what the outcome was. Right. And I feel like um, I've seen a lot of people recently who, who have not followed that page in the book. And I don't know if that's because we're just entering a period of time where emotions are more, uh, heightened, or if I've just had a run of bad luck, where I've I've just you know encountered some people that uh, that that don't have the social graces that we we would hope they've had, but it has reminded me again just sort of, of of the value of of that bit of advice. And what's really interesting about that is I've found that it it when you're in an uncertain uh, environment um, or experience, it is very grounding 
to to say, look, this is the thing I can control, and and I no matter what happens today, if I'm going to go into a negotiation that's going to be rough, or if I don't like what these people are are, are advocating for, um, you know, I I can put myself in a position at the end of the day to say, hey, well, given an imperfect world, I did the best job that I could, and I handled myself with integrity, with grace. I didn't lose my cool. Um, this is something I've been really trying to to push on to my my kids uh, who are now entering adulthood. I, I think it's just a really key life skill, and it's it's a um, it's a way to jujitsu. I think in an experience that could be otherwise overwhelming into something that you know again feels empowering, regardless of the outcome. But I feel like if you take control of yourself this way, you are increasing the odds of getting the type of outcome that you want. So you you've kind of been sort of smiling and nodding and saying all this. Well, no, I mean, it's, it's you know, the the thing, I, and the same thing I, I tell my kids all the time too, which is, you know, you only have one currency in this world that matters, right? You can have all the money in the world, but if you don't have trust and respect from other people, none of it matters. So, you know, if you lie, you bend the truth, you you don't live up to your word, you, you know, you backstab people, you know, that's, it, it maybe it makes you feel good in the short term. Um, but in the long term, you're going to pay the price for that because nobody will trust you in the future. Nobody will want to do business with you. Nobody will, you know, will respect you. And at the end of the day, that's all we have. So, you know, it, it's, you know, whenever you have a, you know, you, and this is, you know, on Twitter as an example, it's really tough, right? Because it's just people say stuff and and they're, they say mean stuff just to be for the sake of being mean, right? And then, you know, this is the thing about, I always joke about with social media, which is, you know, social media is great because we have access to all this information and knowledge and, and all this stuff, this potential that's out there. And all we do is sit around on the toilet and send mean tweets to people we don't even know, right? So, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, but, you know, that's why, you know, it's, but, you know, when people say stuff, your immediate response is to fire back and just, you know, and, and you know, be sharp witted and say something derogatory in return. And, you know, my habits now is I just, if you say something mean or derogatory, I'll just block you and move on. That, that's what the mute button is for. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it's, just, it's, not, it's not worth my time. And more importantly, that's not the person that I want to be. I don't want to be somebody that is negative. And, and this is, as we talked about before, even with the markets, you know, this is why, you know, I want to be optimistic. I want to look forward. I want to, you know, I want to be happy in life. And if you're dragging around a bunch of negativity with you and pessimism, that's your life. You're going to be negative. You're going to be pessimistic and life kind of sucks that way. So, you know, you know, try to be optimistic, try to try to find the better in people and try to bring if you try to bring better out of other people, they will respect you and they, they will honor you and, and, and you'll make the world a better place for you. And we talked a little bit about religion last week. It's the same thing. It's those same, you know, you know, principles that revolve around all religions that if we can bring that into our daily life, not only do we make our life better, we make the world around us a better place. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And again, like you can almost look at it from like a self-interest Machiavellian standpoint that like, hey, if, if I want to get better outcomes for me, <laughs> you know, I need to be a better person, right? That, that's what's going to happen. And it's funny that you you dialed in on Twitter and, and mean tweets because that was that was one of the inspirations, one of the interactions that that made me want to put this on on the rant for the week. Um uh I, I do have you know what you do on Twitter to a certain extent is publicly visible, right? I mean it's 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 a public medium. And um a lot of times people will sometimes ask me like, well hey, why don't you have this guy in your program, right? Um or um uh you know, in certain cases, uh, there'll be exchanges where I don't engage and people will say, well, why are you not engaging with so-and-so, right? And, and it is, in most cases, to take the higher ground, right? To try to not devolve into that, you know, I'm a human, I've got the same response. You have a lance of like, you punch me, I'm, I'm going to punch right back at you, right? But you realize that that is not constructive, right? So um, I'm not going to mention anybody by name, but... Um, why not? No, no, exactly. No, no, no. I'm not gonna mention anybody by name, Fred. <laughs> but Lance Roberts, no. Um, but but yeah, I mean, there are one or two, you know, very popular people sort of in this sort of macro space we talk about that their fans very understandably have said, Hey, Adam, you know, I'd love to have you have this guy on the show, or over time, hey, why haven't you invited this guy on the show? Right. And and I'm not gonna get into reasons why, but I just want to say, like in, in in most cases, like there are reasons why. Uh, that I believe are legitimate. I don't believe that kind of airing it all, you know, publicly serves the interests of of, of the person that they're a fan of. 
um, doesn't serve my interest to get into something that could just sort of turn into some sort of tar pit that that you know you never get out of. Um, and and it, it it would put me, it would cause me to be the type of person that I don't want to be. A really good example is is there's a there's one personality that uh, has repeatedly reached out to me all year, um, wanting to get in the program. Um, when I didn't initially engage, like began kind of bullying me about it publicly. And I chose not to engage. And of course, my non-engagement just enraged the person even more. And so I've had this sort of the steady stream of just like bullying from this person to the point where I sent them a direct message on Twitter and said, hey, look, here's the deal. I have a list of people that I maintain that I I, I would like to get on the program. And, you know, when I can, when, when there's a good time or a topical comment, I said, look, your name has been on that list, but I'm now removing it based upon how you've you know, kind of try to bully and publicly pressure me into getting on here. I'm just letting you know that that approach doesn't work well for me, nor do I think most hosts of a platform like mine. I'm just telling you this for future reference, that if you want to get on other platforms, this is probably not a successful strategy for you. Of course, that just <laughs> you know, generated even more snark from this person, right? So I actually blocked this person this week um, because, uh, again, of just sort of this constant needling. And uh, I rarely block anybody. I usually use the mute button. In this case, I, I blocked, which of course this person then used to try to, you know, sure. martyrize themselves to the community. And people are wondering why I've done it. And look, I'm not going to get into the specifics of the person, but I just want to let you know, like, you know, there are reasons why sometimes when we try to be above the fray and not engage, it's for the reasons that we're talking about here. And it's all about trying not to to get pulled down to a lower level. Yeah, no, I, I it is. And like I said, is you know, we should all just strive to be the best person we can be. I mean, that's, a, that's, you know, if we can do that, we're not, we're, we're going to fail, you know, we're going to fall, we're going to trip, we're going to make, make mistakes. But if we always just strive to be a little bit better each day, then, you know, the world becomes a much better place to live in. Yeah. So, and, and, and underscoring that, which is, you know, that is the one thing we can control. That is where we have agency in uncertainty. And, and like me, I have a very liberal use of the block button. So <laughs> okay. I don't even, I didn't even know there was a mute button. I just go straight to block. So oh, you're, you're a block first, ask questions later kind of guy. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, look, thanks for, thanks for entertaining that rant. Um, let's get to the wrapping up stuff here, folks. Um, a big week ahead. Um, let me let you know who we got on the program. We've got Lachman the Chuthan coming up tomorrow, as I mentioned earlier. Um, I then have Andy Constant, who's been um, one of the personalities that folks have been asking me to get on the program uh, he runs the firm Damp Spring, uh, but we go really deep, Lance, and you probably really enjoy this, into the mechanics of the reverse repo program and the BTFP and what's going on there right now. And a lot of people have been asking, um, my gosh, what's going to happen? Because it looks like the reverse repo program is getting drained and it's going to hit zero at some point. And the the bank term funding program is going to expire in March. Um, what are the implications of both of those things going to be? Um, Andy goes really deep into the technicals of how they work. So if you want to get smart on that, it's a great instructive video for that. Has some interesting conclusions off of that. So I'm just going to leave that out there to say, if you want to find out what they are, go watch that video. Dave Bianco is going to be on next week, as will housing analyst Melody Wright. And when I interviewed her last time, uh, folks who saw that may remember, she literally was like going to a lot of the hottest markets in the country and driving around and finding lots of boots on the ground evidence that was in many times contradictory to what the headlines have been telling us. So she's going to give us her latest update on that. But then she's also going to talk about now that we live in this era of high mortgage rates, um, there's some really interesting creative ways that people are starting to find ways to transact around them. Like you always say, Lance, consumers are creative, right? They're always going to find ways to try to spend money and get commerce done. Some really interesting things popping up in that world. So she's going to talk about that. Um, I also locked in um, Lacey Hunt. Um, I'm going to talk in a second about how, you know, he's going to keynote the up our, our upcoming Thoughtful Money Conference. Uh, but before the conference, we're going to have Lacey actually come on the channel here for the public. Um, and uh, I've been having people ask me forever, when's Lacey going to come back on? Uh, in two weeks, folks. So get ready. Um, and then just a reminder for folks um, who watched the interview I did with Doomberg uh, two weeks or so ago, where he kind of laid it on a big uh, statement saying that he thinks peak cheap oil is a myth and that um, we're actually going to have more oil supply and more affordable oil for the foreseeable future than most people expect right now. I uh, got a lot of really interesting engagement on that video. 
Um, so much so that we're now um, going to be recording a debate between him and Adam Rosenzweig, who's going to be more representing the pig cheap oil um, camp. And so we're going to have a very respectful intellectual exploration uh, of the data there. And I think that's going to be just a fascinating conversation. That's going to get recorded in late January, folks, when we have the actual date that's going to be on the channel. I'll let you know. Um, to the point about the conference, we've just locked in a date for that. And Lance, please make this note of this on your calendar. Saturday, March 18th uh, is going to be the Thoughtful Money Conference. All the details on that will be coming out relatively soon, but I just want folks to be marking their calendars for that. Um, and uh, a reminder that um, I've got my Substack that I'm putting lots of free content out uh, for Thoughtful Money. You can go there at adamtaggart.substack.com. Um, if you upgrade to the premium, two things I want you to know. One is you get my Adams notes, which are my um, detailed cliff notes summaries of the interviews that we do on this channel every week. But also that premium membership also will, will act like a discount card for um, material events and, and any you know other premium content and products that, that Thoughtful Money publishes in the future. So for the upcoming conference, um, I'll share all the details as soon as I've got them, which should be in about a week or so. But uh, we're going to have all sorts of discounts for, you know, early bird purchasers and whatnot of the conference. But if you're a premium subscriber to the Substack, you will get an additional discount off of that. This is almost sort of like a Costco card, right? Where like anything that Thoughtful Money is doing that, that might have a price around it, you'll get a premium, uh, you get a discount by being a premium Substack member. All right. Um, so now that we're here at the very end, Lance, um, first off for folks, if you continue to like these uh, weekly market recaps between Lance and I and would like to see us continue doing it until we ourselves are both over 100 years old, do us a favor and hit the like button and then click the red subscribe button below, as well as the little bell icon right next to it. And as always, Lance, I'm going to giving you the last word here. What are your what are your parting thoughts for folks? Part of your thoughts are, does that subscription get me a $1.50 hot dog as well? Or just for you, Lance? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, actually, uh, be sure and come by our website, realinvestmentadvice.com. Right at the top of the page is that banner for the upcoming uh, economic summit on January the 27th. Adam will be there, myself, Michael Leibowitz, and Greg Valliere talking about political environments, what's going to happen this year, what does it mean for the markets, your money. Love to have you come visit, hang out. Uh, talk. So again, that's on the website now, realinvestmentadvice.com. Just click on the banner. Uh, tickets are limited. So, you know, please do that again because of copyright. We can't record it and produce it later. So you got to come live. And plus, we'd like to meet you anyway. So yeah. realinvestmentadvice.com. All right. Well, very much looking forward to seeing you at that event, Lance, in just two weeks. Um, thanks so much, buddy. It's always great talking with you on these weekly chats. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching.